Well, the most important thing I can say is I am confident that someone with binge eating disorder can completely recover and understand a better relationship with food. Because different than anorexia nervosa, which is complicated to treat, binge eating disorder is just clearly identified as a brain-based illness. And we have both nutritional interventions and medication to help. And ideally, if we can use nutrition and medications, we can provide sustained, lifelong recovery. And so that is my message of hope. It is often there are nutritional deficiencies. We see vitamin D and B12, amino acid deficiencies. So that's step number one, but it's one of the disorders. I'm not afraid to talk about medications for temporary, because it might just be three or four months to really help someone control the appetite disturbance and this inability to have hunger and satiety cues, which most of us can appreciate. Dr. James Greenblatt, welcome to the Root Cause Medicine Podcast. Wonderful to be with you, Kate. Thank you. Of course, I'm thrilled that you're here. This is such an important topic. Because you are one of the world's most prominent experts in eating disorder treatment, I want to ask you right out of the gate the question everyone's wondering, what do you wish more people knew about the root cause of eating disorders? For 25 years now, treating eating disorders from severely hospitalized patients to outpatients, I think one of the frustrating things for me is that what is right in front of our patients struggling with eating disorders is profound malnutrition. And clinicians, doctors, therapists, dietitians are not addressing the malnutrition that is so obvious. So what I would hope people would better appreciate is malnutrition, the deficiency of vitamins, minerals, and essential fats have to be addressed in any treatment program. Mm, that's powerful. So I'm going to dive in deeper to what you mean by that and how people at home can make sure that that does get done for their loved ones, because this issue affects a lot of us. I mean, 9% of our population will have an eating disorder at some point. So chances are, guys, you listening at home, you or someone you love has an eating disorder. But let's frame the issue a bit before we dive in deep. So what is an eating disorder and, and what are the different types? I think people may know about anorexia or bulimia, but there are a number of different types of eating disorders. Yeah, I think in our culture, we're so obsessed with food. I think that there is disordered eating as one term. And then we have psychiatric diagnoses of anorexia nervosa, you know, where people restrict calories and have a distorted sense of a body image. And then there's bulimia, where individuals both restrict and then purge, which could be anything from vomiting to exercising. And then the most common eating disorder that is not discussed enough is actually binge eating disorder, mm. more common than anorexia and bulimia combined. Mm. And these are individuals that it's not overeating, it's consuming a higher amount of food in a very, very fast pace and this inability to modulate hunger and satiety symptoms. Okay. So those are the main ones. And actually, I did not know that binge eating disorder was more common than anorexia and bulimia. That's fascinating. Combined. 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 Yeah. Wow. Okay. So it's interesting. I've listened to you so much. And guys, go buy Dr. Greenblatt's books. If you are a medical professional, you absolutely need to take his training courses. But one of the things I've heard you say before is that you think we should actually be calling anorexia by a different name. What is that name? And yeah, tell us why. Well, you know, I use the term malorexia just to focus on the malnutrition because there's so many paths to individuals who get treated for what you and I would refer to as anorexia nervosa. And that path could be anybody who's had obesity and had bariatric surgery. And because of the chronic malnutrition, we now treat them for anorexia. That path could be somebody with celiac disease, a chronic absorption disorder with a genetic basis. They don't absorb nutrients. They develop anorexia. We've all heard now the discussion around tick-borne illnesses and, and pandas and pans, infections causing eating disorders. So there's so many paths to eating disorders that all eventually result in malnutrition. 
So that's where I came up with the term malorexia. So people don't forget our patients are malnourished. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when you say malnourished, there's a couple of nutrients I hear you talk about frequently that affect people with eating disorders and really play a big role in their symptoms. What are some of those nutrients? I think the most common deficiency that, that we've seen, and there's good research to support it, is the trace mineral zinc. I believe zinc deficiency is very common in the vast majority of the patients I've seen with anorexia nervosa, certainly adolescents. During adolescence, we have a higher need for zinc. And if we're on a vegetarian diet, or we're just restricting calories, it's unlikely that you'll be able to meet that higher demand in adolescence. And I've used the term the perfect storm, mm -hmm. genetic vulnerability, zinc deficiency, adolescence, onset of anorexia nervosa. Wow. So this is so common that you have a name for it, the perfect storm. Okay. Absolutely. And, and there's research in the 80s and 90s, and the vast majority are zinc deficient and zinc supplementation really supports recovery. And I think it is completely ignored by the vast majority of professionals in the eating disorder community. It is. So talk us through what are some of the symptoms of zinc deficiency and how does it impact someone's ability to recover from an eating disorder? Uh, sure, that we could go on for an hour, but I'll give you the five minute version. If we think of zinc uh, involved in uh, the vast majority of enzymes in the brain, so the synthesis of neurotransmitters are critical. And then if we th think of zinc being required for every aspect of digestion, so our taste buds are zinc dependent. Mm. To make acid in the stomach is zinc dependent. And all the digestive enzymes in the pancreas to digest food are zinc dependent enzymes. So if we just take a minute and think about anybody that's had anorexia, what is the common complaint when they're in treatment and they're asked to eat? I feel sick, I get full, I'm bloated, I can't continue to eat. And this is directly related to a chronic zinc deficiency. Wow, that's really powerful and might be really healing for folks at home to hear. I know it was healing for me to learn. I think so many times our patients with anorexia in particular and really most eating disorders can be vulnerable to being kind of gaslit or at least at the very least ignored in the medical setting when it comes to symptoms like gastrointestinal symptoms because often what happens is People assume that somebody with anorexia is just saying they're bloated or uncomfortable because they don't want to eat or they're lying. Or, I mean, what people with eating disorders are frequently told is, well, of course you have gut issues. You messed up your gut when you were anorexic. So it's your fault and just eat normally and it'll go away. But that's not true for a lot of folks with eating disorders. I don't think it's true for anybody. The malnutrition completely wreaks havoc on the digestive system. And you're absolutely right. Clinicians, professionals, we blame the patients. Then it's your eating disorder was the common phrase when patients would complain, rather than saying it is a medical condition that we can treat. So the blaming is such a powerful negative force in the a treatment for eating disorders. We blame doctors and parents and parents blame kids and kids blame doctors and everybody blames the insurance company, but nobody can just accept this is a medical illness that can be treated. Yeah, I'm so glad we're talking about this. Okay, so people might assume that people with eating disorders are screened for these micronutrient deficiencies, but is it common for folks to be checked for zinc deficiency? And how would doctors even check for it if they are screening? It certainly is not common in the eating disorder community. I think in our programs at, at Walden Behavioral Care, the, the doctors are better trained to look at zinc deficiency. Uh, zinc deficiency can be looked at in a blood test, in hair tests, but there are also some medical, what we call functional markers of zinc deficiency, like um, alkaline phosphatase enzymes, white blood cells, and clinical symptoms, frequent infections, colds, flus, things like that. Zinc mm. deficiency is so common, but so ignored by our traditional eating disorder community. 
I've heard people saying that you should check RBC zinc instead of serum zinc. And so for the functional medicine doctors listening, I wanted to get Dr. Greenblatt's advice for us. Tell us, how do you prefer to test for zinc? What do you consider the gold standard? I don't think there is a gold standard. That's why the more tests available helps us. So for me, I'd be looking at those functional markers, white blood cell count, alkaline and phosphatase, an RBC zinc is often better, but not all the time than a serum zinc. So I usually do both. And then hair testing, trace mineral hair testing, we can look at copper and zinc. And with a clinical picture, those tests can usually help sort out a deficiency. Another test that has been very helpful for me that's related to zinc deficiency is cryptopyrrole testing. So that is a, a functional test looking at this cryptopyrrole molecule that binds B6 and zinc. It's not every patient with anorexia, but there's a subset of patients that don't get better without adding B6 with the zinc. Fascinating. Okay. So it sounds like you're not relying on just one biomarker ever. Our tests are good, but the human body is better. And looking at multiple biomarkers can give us the most accurate, personalized treatment plan that our patients desperately need. Well, it's making more sense to me now why this might not be a commonly screened for deficiency, because if, you ha if you're running multiple tests and you're doing that deep dive and really truly looking at a client holistically, that's hard. To, it takes time. That's hard to do in a traditional setting, or at least it takes some intentionality. You no, know, it takes work and learning, although I do think for anorexia, different than almost every other psychiatric disorder I treat, providing nutritional support with zinc, B vitamins, and essential fatty acids could be done immediately without any testing, because we know by definition they are malnourished and supporting those nutritional supplements can simply be helpful. The testing just gives us a much more targeted, personalized treatment plan. So if somebody's at home thinking, zinc, how would I get more zinc? What are some clinical pearls you could share with people about top food sources of zinc and safe ways to chat with their doctor about supplementing it? Well, zinc is most bioavailable in animal products. So the first thing I need to share, which might upset some of the audience listeners is that a vegetarian, more specifically a vegan diet is actually a risk factor for anorexia nervosa. We've, we've known that, we have research to support it. And I'm quite convinced the reason is the lack of bioavailable zinc. So I'm not gonna recommend everyone eats meat, everyone can make those choices, but if you are on a vegetarian diet, you have to supplement with zinc particularly if you're going through adolescence where you have a higher need. So long-winded, we have saying animal products, oysters are certainly yep. good, but supplements work and it's not mega doses. These are relatively low doses of zinc supplements, 15, 30 milligrams. But the most important thing I can say about the supplements is make sure you take it or give it to your child after meals. Otherwise they'll get nauseous and never take it again. So you want to give zinc with or after meals. Okay. I love that. Now, zinc can help with sleep. I've heard you talk about this. Tell us. Yeah, more. zinc is the cofactor to make melatonin. And we've all heard about melatonin. So we need zinc to make serotonin, the neurotransmitter that regulates mood and appetite. And then we need additional zinc to synthesize melatonin. Again, after the GI problems I just mentioned, sleep disturbance, probably the second most common symptom that our patients desperately are looking for help mm. and offering them these nutritional supplements will help. Is there anything else for sleep that you find is helpful beyond zinc? Yeah, probably magnesium is likely the most helpful. Melatonin can help some individuals, but I think magnesium deficiency is also common for most of our patients across multiple psychiatric diagnoses. But for our patients with anorexia nervosa, we usually give a magnesium before mm. bed as well. Wow, that's cool. Okay, I can hear everyone like, not if you're driving in the car listening to this, but if you're at home, you're probably writing this down. <laughs> Remember, you can come back and listen to this again, guys, because we're 
really appreciative that Dr. Greenblatt is sharing all this with us today because this is like so critical, I feel, to really helping folks truly heal and making sure that their recovery efforts go well, right? So that when they start to eat more, they don't get digestive distress. They are not having insomnia. This just makes recovery so much more efficient and in my opinion, successful. So thank you. I'm I'm like so thrilled. You can tell I have a million questions. Omega-3s, let's talk about those. I, I'll tell you, I heard you give a lecture and one of the things you said that really struck me, I had never heard anyone else say this, was you were talking about like the body dysmorphia that can accompany eating disorders and its link to omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. Can you talk more about that? Sure. I mean, I think we're beginning to appreciate the role of fat in our diet for health. And I think everyone needs to understand that 60% of the brain is mm. fat. 60% of the dry weight of the brain is fat. And our patients, our family members struggling with anorexia are, res are restricting fat intake, often for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And there are certain fats, the omega-3 essential fatty acids, that have a critical role in brain function. And we know deficiency states cause perceptual distortions. So we mm. understand that. And we have research where they gave individuals with a disorder called subthreshold psychosis. So they're beginning to have uh, delusional thinking. They just gave them a small dose of omega-3s. And that decreased the delusional thoughts, as well as the amount of medication that was needed over a seven-year follow-up. So omega-3 fatty acids right up there with zinc is critical for organized thoughts and preventing some of the delusional thinking that we often see in patients who struggle with anorexia nervosa. I think it's so refreshing to hear, and which might sound weird to folks at home, but hear me out, <laughs> to hear the word delusional thinking being linked with body dysmorphia, because that's what it truly is, right? It's a delusion. You're looking in the mirror and you're not seeing what's real. And often we kind of shunt that phenomenon over into like, this is very eating disorder specific, this kind of weird, like eating disorder is taking over your brain. We use a lot of talk like that in eating disorder treatment, right? The eating disorder is talking, the eating disorder is saying this to you. When in fact, delusions are part of a lot of psychiatric disorders. And what you're saying is there a symptom that can be addressed with nutrients. For some, absolutely. And I think for eating disorders, when we first started treating in the 60s and 70s, because most of the patients function so well in other areas of their life, we couldn't use the word mm -hmm. delusion, you know, this fixed false belief. But our patients often have these fixed false beliefs about their body, about food, about weight. And we have to, one, appreciate that it's a brain-based illness. Nobody's making this up. And two, we can treat it biologically. Yeah. Can you talk about, there's some brain differences in people with eating disorders when compared to those without. Are you like aware of this research and can you summarize it for our folks at home? Well, I, th I think there's lots of research. I, I think the summary is exactly what you said. There's a number of areas of the brain that we've seen on scans. Those with anorexia are different than those that don't. And I think the message to parents and families and patients just kind of should solidify that this is a brain-based illness. It's nobody's fault. There's likely a, a genetic predisposition that probably goes back thousands of years. Uh, this anorexia gene was probably very adaptive in times of famine when you need, needed to move and look for food. No longer anymore. So it, the brain-based illness is lots of different technical parts of the brain that are bigger or smaller. But if you put it all together, it should just reassure you that we are talking about a brain-based illness. It is not a psychological problem. It becomes a psychological problem, but it's driven by genetics, malnutrition, and what happens as the result of that collision. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love it. 
I'm so grateful that people get to hear you talk about this. One of the studies I read, this probably was 10 years ago, they took mice and deliberately deprived them of food for a specific period of time. And after a while, those mice started to just run incessantly on their wheels. Like a you guys at home picture like a, a cage with a mouse in it, you could, like a gerbil cage. If you've ever owned a gerbil, you know, they have a little wheel they get to run on. And all these mice would do that were hungry and starving were just run on this wheel. And what the researchers said at the end of that study was that they felt that it was an adaptive response to starvation, that if you are a hunter-gatherer, right, or a mammal, and you're in an area where food is scarce, it's actually helpful to kind of turn off your hunger cues and start to run, right? Start to try to get to wherever there would be food. And after I read that paper, it, it hit home for me exactly what you're saying right now, which is, wow, if just restricting food from mice, from mice who don't have access to social media, right? <laughs> and aren't mad at their parents, I don't think, right? Then what does that say about how we need to begin to change the way we're thinking about what motivates food behavior in humans? No, it's a brilliant, brilliant point. I'm glad you read it. And that's really important. I mean, we call it the hyperactivity of starvation. And we've all seen the patients and our family members and the people walking the streets for hours, being kicked out of college gyms, on our hospital floors, pacing back and forth, can't stop moving. And again, just like the distended, bloated bellies, we're saying it's just their eating disorder, but it's not. It's the medical illness mm -hmm. contributing to these behaviors. Yeah, I'm thinking too about Ansel Keys and all the studies that were done in probably the 60s or 70s. Yeah, do you want to talk about earlier in the 40s. 40s, oh, was it? Were you around then? But World War II, so it's another important point that these were healthy men. They were screened to be healthy men. They restricted their calories. They lost weight. And just by the lower body weight, they developed severe psychological symptoms. One man cut off a finger. Again, healthy individuals, restricted calories. So it's another perfect equation. Malnutrition equals psychological symptoms. But please tell me why our eating disorder community doesn't appreciate these simple concepts. We're not teaching them, I don't think. I mean, I remember reading that study. And for those of you, Ansel Keys did studies on starvation in the 40s, which would never be approved today by any IRP by our yeah. board. <laughs> they definitely were not ethical. But I remember being struck by the fact that these otherwise healthy men, at the end of this study, many of them became obsessed with their waistlines and had body dysmorphia. And again, as somebody who is really interested in the root causes of eating disorder behavior, I remember thinking, again, same thing with the, with the mouse study. Like, that's fascinating and should really start to give people who know folks with eating disorders some more context about like what may have started as a diet and now feels really out of control. Truthfully, probably isn't within the person's control. And they need treatment with someone like Dr. Greenblatt to get better. Yeah, I think you brought up the diet. And so a change in diet is the precipitating factor for, for any eating disorders. But I use the example of 10, 12-year-olds all going on a diet or deciding to, to lose weight. And a few people might lose a few pounds, a few people might stop. And there might only be one that has a genetic vulnerability for that diet to change the brain and those unrelenting thoughts of, of thinness and restrict and just take over. Mm -hmm. So there is that genetic vulnerability. And that's why we have to be careful when pediatricians or schools are telling kids they need to lose weight. Very destructive comments. What do you think kids and parents should be told instead? I, I think I'm particularly concerned about pediatricians, the BMI report cards from school. And I think healthy eating should be the message, not a focus on, on weight or scale, which we know kids grow. And, and kids change, and those numbers are devastating. And I can't tell you how many kids we've admitted to an inpatient eating sort of facility because six months earlier, the pediatrician told someone they were a little chubby or should lose 10 pounds. 
Well, they started mm. and couldn't stop. So when you say healthy eating, what we talk about a lot is nutrition by addition. And so I want you to tell us what you mean by healthy eating. But before that, I'll just offer a lot of what we would talk to our kiddos about is like, how many fruits and veggies were they eating? And if they weren't eating a ton, we would find ways to get them to eat more. So not a focus on restriction at all, but what are you not eating enough of? And how do we get you to eat more of those? What do you see as being healthy eating for a kid? I love that term, nutrition by addition. I've not heard that, but that's great. But I think that's the most important concept to just engage kids in healthy foods that they enjoy and that they can choose rather than to be told what to eat. Yeah. And I think, you know, my role has mostly been when it's too late to add the vegetable where we're looking at individuals who require additional nutritional supplements in addition to dietary changes. I'm glad we talked about that. We mentioned zinc and omega-3s. Are there any other nutrient deficiencies that you feel like people with an eating disorder or their parents or their loved ones should know about? Yeah, the other nutrient complex that I would recommend patients take without even testing would be a B vitamin, B complex. Again, it's commonly deficient. There's uh, many B vitamins. One that is probably most helpful is B1, thiamine. We notice um, a lot of our anorexic patients have blood pressure problems. You've heard of POTS, which is unable to regulate a blood pressure. And that has been very uh, often easily treated with B1, thiamine. So we just see B vitamin deficiencies across all of our patients with anorexia. So the zinc essential fatty acids and a B complex is the simplest place to start. And then the, the details would all be filled in by testing because everyone is different. Okay. So folks at home who are thinking, well, how do I test for B vitamins? What do you advise people? Because B vitamins are water soluble. So just checking them in the blood may not give you a whole picture. Are there other markers that, like methylmalonic acid or homocysteine that you'd want folks to be aware of when they're working up their own B vitamin status? Yeah, sure. I mean, two tests that everyone on the planet should have once a year, but certainly our patients with anorexia would be a vitamin B12 level and a vitamin D level. We don't see vitamin D low often with our patients with anorexia, but we do often see vitamin B12. Hmm. And that really impairs recovery because it needs to be treated differently than the B complex that I was referring to. So B12 is a simple blood test. And another, a urine test in the functional medicine community, organic acid test can also help uh, predict the need for certain B vitamins. Mm -hmm. I've seen that used for B6. Are there other B vitamins you're thinking about when you talk about the organic acids testing? Well, the cryptopyrrole, we look for B6, the organic acid, a lot of the B complex, B2, as well as B6. Okay. And guys, you need B vitamins for everything. <laughs> I mean, just like, so thiamine you need for your nervous system to work. Riboflavin, we talked about B6 and how you need that for making dopamine, serotonin, GABA. In the same way you use zinc to make most of your neurotransmitters as a cofactor, you need B6 to make them as well. Folate, you need to make new DNA. B12, you need for cellular energy. I mean, a deficiency in any one of these B vitamins can have pretty important consequences for your health. Yeah, just think of energy, metabolism, mitochondria, just for our body produce energy so you and I can do what we need to get through a day. It takes B vitamins, and that is, again, often deficient, and it would appear to be common sense for someone who has restricted intake. And I think when we talk about these vitamins and minerals, I think we just need to say to people that might not be aware we call them vitamins and minerals because they're essential. The body can't make them and we cannot live without them. And we need an adequate amount for optimal health. And many of our patients with eating disorders are deficient and food is not often enough. And that's where the nutritional supplements are important. So I think somebody at home might be confused thinking, well, my loved one went to eating disorder treatment and they had an RD design their meal plan and they ate that for four weeks. So they should be fine. Why isn't that the full story? 
Well, can I share with you my favorite study? Sure, yeah. This was on a research unit. So in a hospital, it was a research unit where they admitted patients with anorexia nervosa. Everyone was zinc deficient when they came in. So they did a zinc test. Mm -hmm. They showed that everyone was zinc deficient. Those that were treated just by diet, so they were given food to eat, and they had the RDA requirements, so they had enough zinc in their diet. When they left the hospital 30 days later, their zinc was actually lower, okay? Because their body started working, right? They started making enzymes and they started making neurotransmitters. So zinc was used up very quickly. They gave the other half zinc supplements. And those individuals left the hospital with normal zinc levels. So to answer your question, Mm -hmm. this was just one study that demonstrated that adequate food might not be enough to replete the nutrients that our kids or our loved ones have been restricting for months or years. Wow. I love that study. I'm going to have to get that from you later. I think it makes sense to me because what we talk with patients a lot about in nutrition is if you have a deficiency, We need to replete you, which means you'll need what's called supraphysiologic doses of that nutrient for a short period of time. And so in English, if you're deficient in something, you're going to need more than just the minimum daily requirement in order to get you back over the hump and back to repleted status, normal status. So you might need two or three times what your neighbor would need if they're not deficient. Let's take zinc. So you might need two or three times the amount of zinc your neighbor needs for a couple of weeks until you catch up. And I think that's missed a lot of times when we talk about food as medicine treatment, we focus on getting someone what the average person needs, but that's not going to be effective if the person is completely nutrient deficient. Absolutely. It's really important point. I often quote a study on celiac disease, which is often missed in our patients with anorexia nervosa. Mm -hmm. And once they stopped eating gluten, they were, they were zinc deficient but they were zinc deficient for almost a year, even though they were taking zinc. So it takes often a long time to replete nutrients as you just described. So providers and patients have to be aware. And as you said, everyone is different. So celiac disease, I want you to touch on that a little bit more if you're willing to. One of the things I find so interesting is that at least a couple of years ago when I read this study, the average age of diagnosis with celiac was 29. And the average age of diagnosis with anorexia nervosa was 19. And so when I read that, you and I both know that celiac and anorexia nervosa overlap. And so I'd love you to chat more about that. But my initial thought was, my God, how many of these people thought they had anorexia for 10 years before they got their real diagnosis? We see it all the time. And again, it's another test assessment that is not commonly done. It goes both ways. We have a number of of young kids, actually, who have celiac undiagnosed. They develop restricted eating, and they go on to anorexia nervosa, and it could be years before the celiac disease is picked up. And we believe it also goes the other way, that someone with celiac disease, no, with anorexia, can trigger the onset of celiac. I mean, we don't always know what triggers celiac, stress. Pregnancy, viruses are common, but I believe there's also, you know, restrictive eating and inflammation. The paths are similar in that there's malnutrition affecting brain function. Most people think of celiac when they think of somebody who has bloating and GI problems, but what is missed is almost 50% of individuals with celiac do not have the classic GI symptoms. Hold on. Can you say that again? Almost 50% of those with celiac disease do not present with classic GI symptoms. I've seen people come to my office. Their only complaint is fatigue and depression. We do testing. They're malnourished in lots of things, even though they have a healthy diet, which means there's some malabsorption problem. We do testing. It's celiac disease. No GI symptoms at all. And and the research points to almost 50%. So half. So you're just as likely to have celiac and have no gut issues 
as you are to have celiac and have belly issues? Like, what are some of the other symptoms of celiac that would not be gut issues? And to me, it's just related to malnutrition. So right. one, a, a good blood test, you, we see iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, zinc deficiency. So it's fatigue and depression are probably the most common. But many of the patients actually I've seen recently or people that reached out to me, it was anxiety. They had panic attacks and anxiety disorders for years until as an adult, someone tested them for celiac disease. And those psychological symptoms completely disappeared when they were treated. Interesting. I love that you are educating us on this. I want to talk about binge eating disorder for a second because it's interesting. I think a lot of folks with binge eating disorder can feel left out of the conversation when we talk about eating disorders. And so I want to make sure that doesn't happen today. We could do a whole separate podcast on this, um, and we probably will. But is there something that you feel like the person at home who's listening to this and they're thinking, all right, well, I'll, I'll do all these same things. I'm going to get checked for zinc and omega-3s and B vitamins. What are additional things that you find helpful for folks to consider in the treatment of binge eating disorder? Well, the most important thing I, I can say is I'm confident that someone with binge eating disorder can completely recover and understand a, a better relationship with food. Because different than anorexia nervosa, which is complicated to treat for those of us in the field or families, it takes time and energy. Binge eating disorder is just clearly identified as a brain-based illness. And we have both nutritional interventions and medications to help. And ideally, if we can use nutrition and medications, we can provide sustained lifelong recovery. And so that is my message of hope. It is um, often there are nutritional deficiencies. We see vitamin D and B12, amino acid deficiencies. So that's step number one, but it's one of the disorders. I'm not afraid to talk about medications for temporary because it might just be three or four months to really help someone control this, the appetite disturbance and this inability to have hunger and satiety cues, which most of us can appreciate. So using pharmaceuticals to kind of interrupt whatever cycle has been happening with those disordered hunger signals? Yes. My, my first step is nutritional repletion. And then we have some amino acid supplements that can mimic these medications. But if those don't work, I just am really confident that medicines will, without side effects, for a short period of time. Wow. Okay. That's so hopeful. Guys at home, I want you to feel so much hope. Send this to someone who needs to hear that, please, if that just touched your heart. So you mentioned amino acids. And for the person at home who doesn't know what those are, can you explain? Sure. Uh, amino acids are the building blocks of protein, which is every aspect of our structure and our enzymes and how our body works. And the flip side is to get amino acids, we need to eat protein. And there are essential amino acids, just like there are vitamins and minerals our body can't make. There are amino acids our body can't make, and we need to obtain them from the food, the diet. And those are the precursors to neurotransmitters in the brain. So appetite, if we're hungry, if we're full, those are all controlled by amino acids uh, building into peptides small chains of uh, amino acids and bigger chains called proteins, like the neurotransmitters. So poor digestion, not breaking down protein can cause appetite disturbance or just having a restrictive vegan diet with not enough protein can also cause appetite disturbance. And it's bringing it full circle because I know you need stomach acid to break down the proteins that you consume into amino acids that your body can then use to build neurotransmitters. So if you don't have enough zinc and you don't have enough stomach acid, then you can't break down protein, then you can't make enough neurotransmitters. And it totally makes sense to me how this could just be a cascade of malnutrition that someone would have a really tough time getting out of on their own. You know, when we do testing, so amino acid testing, we look at plasma amino acids, Someone who eats adequately might be normal weight or overweight. So they're eating 
a lot of protein, chicken, fish, doesn't matter, but they're, we test the amino acids and they're deficient. Exactly mm -hmm. what you're saying, because they don't have enough digestive uh, enzymes, hydrochloric acid, to break down the protein they're eating. So if you had your way, what would eating disorder treatment look like in the U.S.? Eating disorder treatment would be based on a, a medical model. Now, I hate to say this, but when someone has cancer, right? I mean, they get treated quite nicely by their neighbors, families, and friends. What happens if you have an eating disorder? If you're overweight, people shy away from you and say you're lazy. If you're underweight, people shy away from you and say just eat. So there's no sense of respect. So my wish is that these eating disorders are treated as medical illnesses with the dignity and respect that we treat every other medical illness around. And then the focus being that medical treatment and nutrition is number one. And probably starting with some pretty comprehensive testing to look at if people are even deficient, right? And then how often do they need to take these supplements until they're better? Yeah, I mean, as a functional medicine doctor, psychiatrist, you know, you can't really proceed without the testing because the most important point that I've learned over 30 plus years is that everyone's different just because they have the same name of a disorder, anorexia or binge eating. The profiles might be different. The deficiencies might be different. Your genetics are different. So we have to supplement and treat based on testing. That's just the optimal part of a functional medicine program. So you have a training program where you train clinicians to do this type of medicine for folks with a variety of mental illnesses, eating disorders, psychiatric illnesses. What is it called? And then how do folks find a doctor who's been trained by you who can help them? Sure. Yeah. Our educational platform is Psychiatry Redefined. So psychiatryredefined.org is a website. And yeah, every major psychiatric illness from schizophrenia to depression to eating disorders, we train doctors on this functional approach. And we are developing consumer modules, educational programs for consumers. We just finished the anorexia one, should be available in another month, and we're recording an ADHD one. So we're trying to educate our professionals to change our model in psychiatry. And I think empowering patients and consumers is the only way to really make change. So we'll have those programs available in the fall. And can people find a list of doctors that have completed your training? Oh, sure. On the psychiatryredefined.org website is a provider directory with people from around the country and many countries actually who've done the training so people can look up those numbers there. I want to just put a plug here, guys. Sometimes we can hear this type of thing and it can seem th good in theory, but maybe you go home and you get back to your normal life and you think, well, that can't be my case or that maybe that's true for a couple people with eating disorders, but mine's totally psychological. I have celiac disease and was misdiagnosed as having an eating disorder for a decade, which is actually how I found functional medicine. And so it's why I'm so, I know everything Dr. Greenblatt's saying. I'm like, well, yeah, not only through my own research, but through personal experience. And there's so many of the people I knew who had eating disorders. This was true for me. This type of testing would have changed my life as an 11 year old, would have given me back a decade of my life that I lost by just having no one really truly understand how to find my root cause. And so if I could go back and give my parents this podcast, it would have changed the entire course of my life. Now, I may not have become a doctor, but actually, I think I would have become one anyway. But that's what I want you guys to know is this is happening right now. We are giving you the podcast that somebody in your life, their 11-year-old, your 11-year-old, even your 40-year-old, somebody needs this. It is more common than you would possibly believe that these nutrient deficiencies or celiac or some other type of functional medicine disorder are the root cause of an eating disorder that's been missed. So I am so grateful, Dr. Greenblatt, that you spent this time with us. I want to ask you, because I've actually never heard you answer this, what got you into psychiatry? Well, it, I started in pediatrics, actually. So I wanted to be a pediatrician. And at, at the time, in the 80s, all we did was give antibiotics for ear infections. And so it got pretty boring and I was more interested in the children that didn't go to school or was struggling. And so 
that started my journey on the path to child psychiatry and working with kids. I was always interested in nutrition and brain health. When in college, I was writing papers on it without thinking it'd be part of my career and kind of lost it through medical school and training and learned how to write scripts. But very quickly, when I got in the real world, I, I understood this profound missing link in medicine and particularly psychiatry is understanding the role of nutrition and brain health. It's interesting because I think people hear psychiatry and a lot of my folks did not understand that in order to be a psychiatrist, you have to first be an MD who goes through medical training, just like any other medical specialty. It was four years of medical school and then five years of training to be a child psychiatrist. So, so nine years before we started seeing patients. You have a profound understanding of human physiology before you even start seeing your first mental health patient, which is to me such a big nod to the fact that anybody who's dealing with a client with mental health has to first understand the body. You cannot become someone who prescribes psychiatric medications with a psychology degree. Like it doesn't work. Yeah, there's a, a slide I've been using in my talks now, anatomy for psychiatrists, and there's just a picture of a neck. We have a neck, right? <laughs> what happens in our brain affects our body and what happens in our body affects our brain. We can't just separate a brain to what is happening. Yeah. Your brain is an organ that's connected to the rest of your body through your blood supply and through your neck. Very, very profound. So no one can say it's all in your head. Your head is connected to everything else. For those of you at home who want to learn more from Dr. Greenblatt, we're going to make sure that he lists out his websites for you, where you can find him on social media. And I just want to encourage you, sign up for the newsletter. Dr. Greenblatt gives so many free talks. Like, you're just giving away this information for free, which is part of what I absolutely love about what you're doing in the world because so many people could put this behind a paywall, but it seems like every other week you're doing a free webinar on some topic in psychiatry. Why is that important to you? Well, Kate, uh, people are suffering needlessly and our model, our current model is just polypharmacy, whether it's for anorexia or depression. And the second med is added and a third and fourth and fifth. And some of this information is simple and can change lives. So that is important to me. And that's why we're trying to do as much as we can to educate professionals and consumers. I'm glad you are. Can you tell people some of the names of the books that you've written? I think there are seven. The Answers to Anorexia, Binge Eating, Integrative Medicine for Binge Eating, Depression, Alzheimer's, Nutritional Lithium, and the, uh, the last book is on a, a functional medicine approach to antidepressant withdrawal. And this is written more as a textbook for professionals. It'd be a very difficult read for patients, but it's a professional guide to some of these tests that we've talked about of how we can safely taper someone off psychiatric medications. And you have one on ADHD as well. Finally focused, yes, probably the most, um, the earliest first one and the easiest to read and, and most read, uh, finally focused is a kind of nutritional blueprint for helping parents and adults with ADHD with simple nutritional interventions that often can eliminate the need for medications. Yeah, they really work, guys. I will attest to this. I've seen it work in clinical practice. Your title for the lithium book, is it a Cinderella story? Yes. Yeah. Wait, tell us why. Why did you choose that title? Well, just because it's one of these neglected, ignored nutrients that has such a powerful effect when you can appreciate the beauty and what it does. And so it has been my passion for my entire career that people understand this trace mineral, not the prescription medication, a trace mineral that's essential for brain health. It actually prevents Alzheimer's and dementia and established as a preventative nutrient for suicide. So the public health implications are just profound. The lithium carbonate for you guys at home is the medication that you may have heard of being used for people with bipolar disorder. And it's typically given in really high doses, something like 1300 milligrams. And when you hear Dr. Greenblatt talking about lithium, the nutrient, it's usually something more like lithium orotate at like 10 to 20 milligrams. Tell What's the difference? Absolutely. No, we start actually with one milligram. So we have kids on one or two milligrams and might go up to 10 or 20 milligrams. But 
it is very different than the prescription medication and typically uh, no side effects and very easy to take and can be incredibly helpful for individuals with the primary symptom is irritability. And, and we know that it cuts across many disorders that our patients struggle with. So it helps with the irritability. Can you share about drink, the studies that have been done with drinking water and lithium levels? Because I think that's a really powerful illustration of why this nutrient matters. Sure. We have studies from across the globe. So 10, 15 countries around the globe, all demonstrating the exact same thing. The amount of lithium in the tap water, in your drinking water, is associated with suicide risk. So if you have low lithium in the water, in the area of the country you live in, then you're going to have high suicides in that community. If you have high lithium, it is protective. And lithium is in our water supply, so it varies. And some of the studies, the first ones were done in Texas. So Texas is a big state. Different parts of Texas has different amounts of lithium in the drinking water. I just need to add how many people are drinking tap water now everyone's drinking bottled water. And in my testing over in this trace mineral hair test, the amount of undetectable lithium has just dramatically increased over the past 20 years where people are putting filters and drinking bottled water. We're just getting less lithium in our food supply. Wow. And I mean, over the last 20 years, I think it's fair to say that the instance of mental health disorders has increased dramatically. Fascinating. So you mentioned a hair mineral analysis for lithium. Why can't you just test blood for lithium? Well, uh, if you're not taking prescription medicine, you and I should not have any lithium levels in our blood. So there's no way of detecting lithium in the blood. But a trace mineral hair test, I've been looking at this test for almost 30 years, and it is pretty accurate predictor of undetectable stores or normal stores of lithium. Okay, because we store minerals in our tissues, right? So like our, our organs, but we also store them in our nails and in our hair. And it sounds like you're screening to make sure that the person doesn't have no lithium. Correct. We still might use lithium if someone has normal levels, but oftentimes we have an irritable, angry, impulsive child or adolescent. More times than not, we're going to have low levels of lithium and small amounts of lithium or tape can be incredibly helpful. That's beautiful. I think one of the things I remember learning about hair tests is that they can be subject to contamination, even just from environmental, like from air, right? So when we do studies of populations and we can look at how much mercury are they exposed to in the air by looking at hair, but that isn't really the case when we're looking to see if someone has none of a nutrient, right? Correct. <laughs> you're less yeah, likely you're... to get a false positive. Yeah, I've never seen the lithium be a variable that is concerning. You know, we have kids in swimming pools and chlorine messing up hair tests, and we have lots of other contaminants in shampoo, but I've never really seen lithium as a contaminant. So it's been a pretty accurate uh, predictor. Awesome. Is there anything else that you feel like is important to leave with our audience today? Well, one, I just wanted to thank you for sharing your story. I think it's powerful for people to hear, and I appreciate your sharing that because it brings it home to all of us. And I think the most important thing I try to end all the time is, is one uh, hope because there's just so much we can do to treat mental illness now. And, you know, medicines aren't the enemy, but it's certainly not the only path. So nutrients and a functional medicine model that you've been discussing for your career can make a huge difference in those struggling with all different diagnoses in mental health and mental illness. Well, thank you, Dr. James Greenblatt, for all the work you've done over the last decades to help people with mental health issues, for all the work you're doing to educate the public, and for being here today. Great. Thank you, Kate.